Welcome, friends of ODF. And today we will have Robin sharing with us about uh, filling the coastal data gaps. Let's do it ourselves. So she will share with us our seventh innovation cycle, the Do It Ourselves Challenge in collaboration with um, Chalmers River Lab and that builds on ODF's previous innovation cycles. And in this Do It Ourselves Challenge, we will step a bit outside our comfort zone by moving from ODF data analysis activities to wrestling something about really creating data or collecting data in this data knowledge action chain. And I think most of you here, um, you already know Robin, but as part of this webinar introduction, I will still um, introduce her um, maybe we will have an online audience later also on YouTube. So yeah. So Robin is Professor Management of Digitalization at the Technology Management and Economics Department at Chalmers. She's also Director of Ocean Data Factory Sweden. And she's also Director of Production 2030 Research Project Ocean LSAM and co-founder of Ocean Tech Hub LDA in Panish, Portugal. And the goal is of developing a blue circular economy model. So you can see that she really has passion <laughs> for ocean and sustainability. Yeah. yeah. So now, Robin, please, the stage is yours. Okay, great. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks, Xixin. And thank you as everyone for coming. Um, this is gonna be a really interesting uh, webinar. As Yishin said, we're getting out of our comfort zone and I can say I am really jumping out of my comfort zone, but that's the best way to learn, uh, I think. And, um, and also the best way to learn is to teach. And so that's one of the reasons uh, that actually I'm standing here today and presenting uh, the seventh innovation cycle, which I'll get back to on that. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you, I will share my screen uh, now. Let's see if I can do that okay. You've, um, let's see, there we go. Yep, share, perfect, okay. So yes, as Yishin mentioned, um, this is the seventh innovation cycle for Ocean Data Factory. Um, and this title comes from Torsten. Uh, which is very much this let's do it ourselves. And what we've been trying to do is find a, a purpose for let's do it ourselves. And we thought, well, what about coastal data gaps? What, since as we all know, whether it's here in Sweden or in Portugal or in many places in the world, we have a lot of missing data along our coastlines. And so is there a way that we could actually work together to fill these? And here it is very much also about thinking around low cost sensors, it's around citizen science. And so we'll see how we, uh, how we fulfill this uh, challenge. But to give you a little background, I'm not sure this again, as Yishin mentioned that this is, will be on YouTube. And for those who don't know Ocean Data Factory, Ocean Data Factory Sweden started about uh, four years ago, three, four years ago. And really the whole purpose is to, as we can see, read there, to solve our global challenges through turning ocean data into innovation opportunities for the digital blue economy. But I think really what is very important here is that we focus very much on not starting with the data, but starting with the challenge. What are our use cases? What are our challenges? And then how can then we find the data that we need for that and actually use that to help solve uh, and address these challenges? And just to look back, one of some of the things that we've been working on has been when in 2019, looking at the spread of invasive species, this killer shrimp, where we even did a Kaggle challenge where we invited people from around the world uh, to develop and look at the data that we'd uh, collected. Also in terms of 2020, doing the Coster challenge where we again reached reach out to others or to our community and others beyond to actually help us with um, object recognition where we were looking at uh, identifying objects on the bottom of the seafloor and outside of the coast of Sweden, or off the coast of Sweden. We've also very much looked at the spread of harmful algae bloom blooms. Is it possible to predict this? This is a project that's still ongoing. And again, using very much citizens and our community to help collect data uh, and created sites where you can upload information and photos on the spread of, of algae blooms. 
In 2021, we then decided, well, let's uh, let's try to grow our community. And with the reason that we're doing our webinar right now is very much a result of that, where he said, how can we reach out beyond Sweden? I see who else is out there in terms of how can we work together, collaborate to take on our ocean data challenges or ocean challenges. So I think really what we see here, if we think about Ocean Data Factory is very much, again, thinking around where the data availability, how can we make this available? And then, but really again, very much around the various challenges that we have. But what under is underlying all of this is very much a collaboration with community about raising ocean literacy, working together and you know, there are possibilities of working with citizen science, for example, as well. And while we've done these two projects recently, what we see is that well, what about, you know, how do we create kind of more of, of lasting results? And, and Torsten, I'm going to ask you in a couple minutes to, to speak a little bit around this more. But what we see is that we'd really like to go beyond this. And is there a way that we can work together with our community to actually think through the whole cycle? And as Yishin mentioned, you know, rattling this chain, the links of the, the data knowledge action chain and really saying, what could we do ourselves? Could we actually work together with people out there and really start doing this ourselves in terms of collecting ocean data as well? How can we start filling the data gaps? And so the idea is that Torsten proposed in the fall was could we do a next innovation cycle related to do it ourselves? So Torsten, would you like to just say a, a couple words there around, uh, yes, your thoughts behind why do you see it's important that Ocean Data Factory does this do-it-ourselves cycle? Sure. Uh, the, the, the thinking behind it is that our two previous uh, innovation cycles, number five about data availability and number six about citizen science, they both created a, a lot of insights, but it was sort of internal uh, and to some extent, knowledge uh, creation, but, but no really tangible results. And on top of that, the, the knowledge that we gained was a lot about the challenges, to some extent also about the opportunities and how to go forward, but especially the data availability at, uh, innovation cycle, that ended uh, to some extent, a lot about uh, with, with the frustration at, that there is so much data about that out there, but actually making use of it is super challenging. And the idea is, that we uh, have in this seventh cycle is that at least some of that frustration will we be able to address if we do it ourselves. If we collect data and, uh, and have the ambition of making it available, then we, we ourselves will encounter and have to address all the issues with making data available to the people who actually needs it. And while doing that, we will also have to go through at least a sizable amount of the issues, the, the things that are related to the seventh cycle, the citizen science reaching out part, uh, making things um, leverage what we do by engaging others and reach, uh, and going through the whole chain all the way to the end users. Uh, so a lot of what we have learned uh, and what we have learned that we still need to learn in the <laughs> two previous cycles, will we, that's what we hope to address in this do it ourselves. A little bit of less talking and a little bit of more doing. Yeah. Maybe that uh, brings some clarity. I don't know. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, very good. I think it is very much about this aspect of doing and taking it through the whole cycle. But then really much starting again with the different challenges or the use cases, you know, what are the use cases that we have? And then how can we think about, okay, which data do we need and how can we collect that in the best way? And can we do it ourselves? So about uh, a month ago, uh, Torsten and I were talking about this and well, how do we really get started? What can we really do? 
you know, can, can we really build sensors and, and who will do this and, and how will we really work with this? And so we start, you know, he, he showed this in, in October at our grand meeting. And we think about this whole process. It is it is quite an extensive process. We think about everything from leading, coordinating, to building, deploying, managing, analyzing, creating impact. But we thought, well, again, you know, let's work with others. How can we work with others to actually achieve this? And so could we really think about building hardware and software? And but but who actually will do this? And so again, we were brainstorming and we were thinking about uh, you know this nice uh, this nice um, gra or let's say figure that that Torsten had uh, made, where we think about you know the going through the whole chain, and we started thinking, well, how could we actually do this? And which partner could actually lead this? So which partner within o ODF? And I said, well, you know, I do have a course coming up uh, where I teach at Chalmers. And one of the main things that I like to do with my students is very much encourage them to get out there and work with real life cases. And so instead of them, say, writing exams and regurgitating material, I've been working with this uh, live case approach uh, for some years now, since I was a professor at Handels in Stockholm before, until all the way through at Chalmers, where we really work together with companies, with organizations, with society to create value that goes beyond the, 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 raw, the walls of the classroom. And so the course that I'm teaching in the spring, I'm actually teaching it right now and I'm doubling up. I'll be teaching it again in this, uh, this uh, the, the next uh, reading period or the next trimester or quarter, uh, which starts uh, soon. Um, it's called, the course is called Leading in a Digital World, and I will be teaching it together with uh, Ida, who was here today as well. Uh, she's a PhD student, and she says also a software engineer, uh, and is studying also very much the ecosystems and has very much involved uh, with me in these different areas. So we'll be teaching this course uh, starting uh, in, in March. And when we teach these live cases, we like to have real sponsors. So organizations that really have challenges, true challenges that the students can work with. So that's not a hypothetical exercise. And so we had a great conversation with Patrick from the SMHI who's here today. And he just, yes, let's do something. And so that was the beginning of it. So we're very happy. I'll let Patrick speak a little bit later about that. But I think it's fantastic to see the, the reception that the ODF community has that, yes, there are challenges out there, and this would be a fantastic opportunity to work together with students to actually solve our ocean challenges. We then had a, a, a meeting with uh, Robert Mertens from Moringo, uh, and he also was like, yes, this would be fantastic. So beginning to see sponsors from different areas, uh, you know, organizations that have challenges, and I, as mentioned, uh, Yushin mentioned in the very beginning, I am the co-founder of a company in Portugal called Ocean Tech Hub, where we're also working with collecting coastal data uh, for, this, for the small, medium-sized commercial fishing industry. So we're also very much supporting this. So who are these students? Well, the students are, um, they're in their second year at Chalmers and they're studying industrial economics. So they are, you know, quite young and they're quite new in the program. And I can mention that one of the things that has happened is this program has this, the study of program that they're doing has been uh, revamped. So they are now in a new version of the program where there's a tremendous focus on data and data science and AI. But most of the courses are very much around, well, here's a set of data, you know, go analyze it, or here's this, you know, go do this, but they don't actually have to go out and do anything live. And so we thought this would be the perfect opportunity for these students at the end of their second year to actually do take on a real live challenge. So if we think about, you know, what this is all about, so it'll be myself and, uh, and Ida, who will be the, the Chalmers faculty. Now, there are about 110 students in this course, so it's quite a lot of students. And I've been running, this will be the, the fifth time, the sixth time I'll run this course. And what we do is we divide the students into 20 groups. So there are about five to six students per group. And this year, the sponsors are, as I mentioned, Ocean Data Factory, SMHI, Moringo, Ocean Tech Hub. And we'd also like to say if there's someone else who would love to be part of this, please uh, let us know. We are open for more sponsors. 
And the idea is that uh, we will help, you know, work with these students to fill these coastal data gaps. And the idea is through this kind of do-it-yourself marine citizen science. And through this, we hope to increase students' literacy and also strengthen their data skills. I'll send out these slides so people will have access to these. But I think with the whole idea is, you know, let's think of these different challenges that these students can go after. What data we need, do we need to solve the different coastal uh, challenges that we have? And the idea here is that the students will actually be doing this ourselves, right? So they're going to be hands-on building hardware uh, prototypes or pretendo types, uh, working with software. Uh, and also they'll be having to do a Google site where they explain uh, what they're actually, the, the digital innovation that they have developed uh, to collect data uh, and how that, you know, what they will be then doing, what the, what the data should be used for. These students will pitch their digital innovation. They will submit a, a pitch uh, presentation, a poster and a video. And hopefully at the end of June, uh, we will have a, a pitch pitching uh, presentation where all 20 groups will come and pitch uh, to the ODF community uh, their digital innovations that they've done to, yeah, to fill these uh, coastal data gaps. We also have, a, we're working with Chalmers Revere Lab, uh, the autonomous underwater vehicle uh, lab or underwater autonomous vehicle lab uh, on Lindholman and the Fuse Lab, the new makerspace that Chalmers started uh, in the fall. And I've gotten great response from the people running these labs as well. So this will run from March to June. So that's just a brief overview. To give you an idea about what the students have done previously to, to kind of fill in that, we've been, as mentioned, been doing this for quite some time. So we've been working both with um, regions or municipalities, with cities and organizations of all different types, whether it's been more of a state or, you know, commercial such as IKEA. So just to give you an idea, we did the Lisa Shield Challenge in 2019, where the students were to come up with a digital innovation to help Lisa Shield's community be more sustainable, or just really anything to you know to follow to pursue their vision of a whole bar attractive commune or through some shenar techniques of creativity, creativity or framtids through. So the idea there was the students in their teams developed uh, different digital innovations. We had a poster um, presentation where the students, all the posters were hung up in Lisa Schill, uh, and with QR codes where the citizens of Lisa Schill could learn more about the project. Uh, and then there was also a winner of the innovation challenge uh, that we have. So it's very, the students get very engaged. Uh, the next year we did the Smart City Challenge with the city of Gothenburg. And again, here the focus was a lot on using data whether it was geo data, open data, statistics, uh, and coming up with different uh, ideas. Here was the winning team of this year was Matvin. It's a way to reduce the amount of uh, wasted food in public organizations such as schools and so on. So here was the team presenting their, their uh, winning challenge or their winning innovation. And here, what we do is the student teams, we, uh, we, they, you know, they pitch, they make their innovations and we have it online. And we both have a, a jury that's kind of within the, the, um, the faculty team and the sponsors and, and some external outsiders, but we also have opened it up for citizens to come in and vote. So they can click on a video and look at the video and see, wow, well, this is, this is interesting. We could uh, do something uh, like, you know, we like this one, let's vote on this one. We've also done it with Academis Gahus where they looked into the future of, um, of university campuses. Uh, and the last year and this year, we've been working with IKEA. Uh, both in terms of uh, global sustainability and supply chains, as well as, say, this year, one of the things they were looking at was, say, digital innovations to improve uh, human resources. So, again, they've been doing a lot of different types of, of challenges here. So we have quite a very well-developed um, system or you know chain of events uh, that the students go through uh, in order to develop their challenges or, or their innovations and present them. So this year, the idea again is okay. Let's let's go for it. Let's combine our resources at ODF, SMHI, Moringo, Ocean Tech Hub, and other sponsors with those of Chalmers. And what can we do? Let's go after. Let's figure out. Can we actually do something new? And this is a break from the previous years, because at Chalmers, the the with the courses, the five that I showed you, they've only been around digital innovation. So it's been like an app or it's been very little about actually, you know, building hardware. 
But uh, now we really have the possibility with ODF and with the seventh innovation cycle to really do something and build, because now we're seeing that there are possibilities at Chalmers where students can get their hands on things and start building. So as mentioned, we have the Revere Lab and the Fuse Makerspace that they can be working with. So how, how will, what will they do? And this is where I need your help and where I am very much stepping out of my comfort zone because I know very little about this. I am not an engineer. Uh, you know, I come from uh, business and administ business administration. So I've been, uh, you know, crash coursing in learning about uh, these different issues of building low cost sensors for data collection. So just take you through a couple, you know, some things that I found and just recently since uh, Torsten and I decided to do this. And when we think about the different, you know, coastal data, um, I try to always structure uh, things for the students. And I found this uh, in a report by the European Marine Board uh, that was based on a study of, I can't remember the person's name, Tila, I think it was, who'd done a study of something like 322 or several hundred uh, citizen science uh, data collection projects. And this was kind of just the overview of the different types of data and where they were coming from, where they were being collected. You know, you could think about above the surface, near the surface and below the surface, where most of it is very much occurring along the coastline. Um, so while we can think about that, it's also about, well, what, what are these, you know, the data gaps and what are the use cases? And I think what's very interesting is, you know, what really are these different use cases? Um, and so what I'd like to do now is just show you a little bit about some of the things that I found online uh, where other do-it-yourself um, experiments and, and different uh, uh, collection efforts have been done. And then I'll come, I'd like to come back uh, and talk more about this slide. Uh, because I really, you know, what type of data sh is possible for students to, you know, to build a sensor around to collect, but then again, more importantly, what is the real use case uh, for this and who is kind of the, 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 who will be using the data or be interested in the analysis uh, that comes from the, from the, from the data that are collected. So here are just some of the different uh, citizen science or these different uh, do-it-yourself uh, uh, low cost sensors that I found out there. Uh, here's a buoy uh, that uh, was this called this Kduino, uh, where you can create this, uh, you know, nice uh, uh, plastic bottle with sensors inside it, inside it. And this does that, uh, you know, I'm still learning about this, this underwater diffuse attenuation coefficient. So I found a paper around this. But the interesting thing was that, you know, the, to build this only cost around $60. Uh, which is not very much money at all. And not only that, it looks, it seemed to be quite an, you know, easy thing to actually put together. So this, you know, very, quite encouraging. So there was a nice buoy that had been found. And, you know, this is kind of, and then we last um, week or two weeks ago, I can't remember when, uh, it was two weeks ago, Torsten and I were, were at Oslo Met in, uh, at their ocean lab in Oslo. And we were presenting uh, the case and some, we were talking about hydrophones and is it possible? And, and Pierre, who was there, said, oh, yeah, he Googled and he found something right away about how you can use your smartphone and create a very simple hydrophone. And I just found something like this again, you know, an easy, simple uh, hydrophone uh, that one could that one can build quite cheaply. This is one of the ones that I've been following for some time where they built a smart fin with sensors uh, in the uh, in the surfboard fin. Uh, and last I heard it was temperature and they were doing something with pH, I believe now. Um, the person behind this has been in, in Sweden a couple of times. I think this is also, you know, something that the students could be thinking about. What type of uh, are, you know, say tourists out there? Is it a stand up paddleboard, which I also saw something else? Is it, uh, well, for example, um, Robert from Moringo was talking about creating something that could, the students uh, could build that could follow a sailboat, for example, and collect data. I found another one uh, where they were doing uh, solar powered drifters uh, for marine litter tracking uh, and simple, simple things again that uh, these that students were building uh, for very cheap. So I think there's an incredible amount of things that can be done, a lot of different data uh, that can be collected. Uh, here was this low cost uh, water level sensor uh, that was made. Uh, very cheaply, another thing there. And why not go ahead and build your own, you know, submarine? Uh, you know, this was also, there's just so much information out there. Um, or air quality monitoring. I'm thinking about in, in for example, in, um, 
in boat harbors, for example, in marinas, you know, seeing what, what is the air quality like as engines become or bigger and bigger, or, or what about in terms of the noise that we just saw? Or why not with drones, where I've seen a few different projects where you actually have either you know, taking pictures and looking at coastal erosion or the rocks falling or something related to marine litter. So there's a lot out there. So this was a very fast uh, run through, but I thought that we could use the remaining time to have a discussion amongst ourselves. Uh, and in the meantime, while we're having a discussion that, um, you know, here's a nice menti if you could, you know, would like to fill that out in terms of, you know, what data use cases do you see? What are the challenges that we that we need to solve and which data do we need uh, in order to help solve those or what are the potential coastal data gaps? So 